if I just give a little bit of a background as to uh, what we've been doing as part of the um, Valley Biodiversity Group, I'm part of that group. Um, and I would think all of about two or three weeks ago, we decided it might be quite a good idea to uh, um, celebrate the fact that we'd actually been trying to do something for a year. And um, so that meant slightly panicking and uh, looking at what we could do and what was available. So we've had uh, a few walks and Simon is going to give us a talk from the West Country Rivers Trust in a minute. Uh, it's the first time we've tried to do anything like that, but uh, it's, uh, it's great to see so many people here, especially as we've probably got the best weather that we've had for about a week. So uh, thank you all for coming along. And uh, I, I'm sure you'll enjoy the talk. Um, I've been chatting to, to Simon beforehand and uh, he will obviously introduce himself a little bit and the, uh, the work that he does at the Trust. But I had to declare an interest because I used to work also for uh, the Anglian Water. So we've been talking a little bit about uh, the monitoring and the sides of things, which in my case was a long time ago. But uh, anyway, Simon, welcome. Thanks very much for agreeing to do this talk and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. No problem. Thank, thanks very much for having me along. Um, uh, as John said, well, he didn't say, but I, I've worked for West Country River Trust now for um, uh, getting on for six years, I suppose. I will just share my screen. I'll put that um, title screen up. So that, um, can everybody see the presentation? Yep, I can, fine. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so as it says down there, I'm a Senior Data and Evidence Officer at West Country Rivers Trust. Um, that really means essentially monitoring, uh, gathering environmental data, particularly about our rivers, but more and more these days, it's not just the rivers. We tend to, when we are recording data about rivers, we're also recording data about rainfall and soil health and um, various other things around the catchment to sort of integrate everything, you know, that goes on around the river and in the river. Um, as I was saying to John before that, my role at West Country Rivers Trust encompasses everything from kind of engagement type monitoring, so going to talking to schools and going into the river with, with kids, um, doing some, running through some of the river tests and running through river systems and how they work, all the way through sort of working with Southwest Water or the Environment Agency on, on kind of more operational type monitoring um, through to kind of research with various universities and other research organisations. So uh, quite a wide remit. Um, and one of, the, one of the most rewarding, certainly, and useful parts of that role is the volunteer monitoring, which kind of brings me here to talk to you today. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the, the presentation in a second. Um, the only other, the only thing is, I said to John, I give a different presentation every time. I've never given this presentation, so I'm not entirely how long, sure how long it'll take me. Um, but it was part of the brief was to include a, a sort of um, a reference or a, an understanding of how the scheme helps promote biodiversity, which was a, quite an interesting little twist on things because I don't normally slant it that way, but it made complete sense to me actually when we think about it, although we don't always couch it in those terms, we're aiming, everything we aim to do is to kind of promote and increase and protect biodiversity in some way, shape or form. So hopefully that will become evident as we go through. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll prattle on for a while uh, about uh, West Country Rivers Trust and, and Rivers Trust in general, uh, what we know about the rivers of the West Country um, and how that links with biodiversity. I'll talk about some of the kind of everyday threats that our rivers are facing and then I'll, I'll wrap up really by talking about how the volunteer monitoring scheme fits in. So West Country Rivers Trust is now 26 years old, was it 27? That was, a, that was our badge from a couple of years ago. We are the oldest of the Rivers Trusts um, and we were, the, uh, sorry, we were the first. Um, we are also geographically the largest and largest in terms of staff numbers. We currently have around 60 members of staff based in Stoke Climsland, which is on the border of Devon and Cornwall. And as you can see from that, um, that map there, we are we the green, green lot down the southwest. Um, pretty much the whole country now is covered by rivers trusts of varying sizes, shapes, ages, and capabilities. Um, 
it's interesting though that those 60 staff um we are covering an awful lot awfully large area and lots and lots of rivers um i always think we could justifiably have six or seven rivers trusts in the west country alone so we're spread fairly thinly and that's the problem sometimes because a lot of our funding a lot of our work if you like is geographically constrained so we might have a project to work in the Colm catchment or the tamar catchment and that can leave us a bit um, thin on the ground everywhere else which again is where the volunteer monitoring scheme is absolutely fantastic because it gives us eyes and ears and influence and a stake if you like in in any river in the west country which is wonderful a real real bonus so I've got these couple of slides. This one first is a picture we had commissioned 10 years or so ago. We call it good farm, bad farm. And it really sums up in one picture, which I think is nice, um, a lot about what we do and a lot about what, what the problems are and what the solutions are. So I don't know if, if screens are doing weird mirroring things. Hopefully it's fairly obvious, which is, the, um, which is the bad farm. It's on my left, but it might be on my right, on your right. But, um, and these are kind of everyday things that you'll see across the countryside. But on the right hand side of the river, um, you can see the kind of the best practice and what we, the, the easy things, if you like, we can encourage farmers in particular to do. And so there's things like vegetated buffer strips. You'll see there's lots more ponds in the landscape, um, the lower stocking densities. There's even a little guy testing soil there. Soil is really important. Different ways of cropping, different ways of um, crossing the river there. There's a little bridge rather than just driving straight through it. And, and ways of handling sort of clean and dirty water separation on farm, farm buildings. So, you know, as you can imagine, um, with the whole of the West Country to play in and, and hundreds of rivers to look after, just doing these kind of things, trying to promote that kind of behaviour keeps us very busy. And we have a, we have a team of land advisors um, who are probably about 12 or 15 strong now, I think, trying to do that all around the place. The other area we've been working in increasingly in the last five or six years in, in, is in urban areas, obviously across our countryside, across the region, this is where most of the people live, um, and they can have a massive impact on rivers themselves. So in a kind of slightly um, odd perspective, this is kind of a good town, bad town. So on this one, the good town is kind of north of the river or, or above, it, above it and below, again, is the bad town. And again, we'll recognize all sorts of things there. So just kind of grayness, um, diffuse urban pollution being channeled straight into rivers, um, rubbish being left around, all that kind of, all that kind of thing. Whereas on the other side of the river, you know, the future we kind of hope for and where we try and bring it about is much more green spaces. Rivers through urban areas may be daylighted or left above ground rather than culverted, um, with a bit of a green space around them to help manage rainfall runoff and help clean that water before it reaches the rivers which is a really key point actually, is, is how rainfall interacts with rivers. And this next slide um, really shows in the West Country, uh, more than anywhere else, I think, how dense our river network is. So you can already see over in the east where we get into Somerset, those white patches start to appear. So that's when you get onto the chalk where, and the limestone where water will more readily soak into the ground. On our part of the West Country, and you can see the, see the Sid nestled in here next to the otter, um, in our part of the West Country, we're really, really surface water dominated. You know, the landscape doesn't absorb water well. It, it very quickly runs into drainage ditches and small streams and tributaries, which end up in the bigger rivers. And again, again, this is here, it gives you a bit of an appreciation, the job on our hands in the sense of, of um, covering such a massive area with so many iconic rivers. It's a real privilege to work here, actually. I think a lot of the other rivers trusts are very jealous of the patch we have. One of the key, um, other key sort of uh, players, if you like, in the, in the river landscape is the Environment Agency. And this slide shows how the Environment Agency break down the landscape into river catchments or actually water bodies. You see some of the, so again, the SID is this one here, that's the otter. So whilst the SID is effectively one water body, um, other, other rivers like, you know, so the Tamar or the X is broken down into, into sub-catchments and sub-sub-catchments, um, sort of management units, if you like, for the Environment Agency that allow them to design their monitoring plans and um, basically keep an eye on things. And again, as you can see, there's a lot of them. Just, just in the West Country Rivers Trust patch, there is 854, I think, water bodies. Um, You'll notice what I have here is you'll notice all these small water bodies, particularly, I mean, where I'm from, the North 
Cornwall coast, but all around the coast, these small water bodies. And I think it was 2014, the Environment Agency kind of did away with a lot of those. They said they're too small, we don't have to monitor them, so we're not going to. And so in the in the um, the latest map like this that the Environment Agency used, most of the coast is kind of missing. We've got, we are, we're still using this one. And again, it's because each of these rivers, you know, no matter how small, where there's water, there's life essentially. And, and, and as we'll come on to, you know, rivers are so important for biodiversity that each of these, and in a sense, the smaller and more isolated catchment, the higher potential there is for interesting and varied species to live there. So as far as we're concerned, every single one of those is worth protecting with the same kind of vigor that, that the big ones are. But I, I understand that the environment is you do have to kind of prioritize things and it's it's fairly easy to, to knock off a lot of the little ones. So um, coming on to the river sit then, and as I, I would I would wouldn't claim to be a local expert at all, as I say, it's 854 water bodies to get to know. I feel I know the SID a little bit through talking with Jan and her colleagues in the CSI group um, over the last few months. But it's always, my first port of call is essentially the Environment Agency. Um, this is from their Catchment Data Explorer. So if you're interested in this, you could put Catchment Data Explorer into Google and you'll find yourself here. This up at the top here, it gives you a clue as to how the river systems are broken down. So we have, um, we're in the Southwest River Basin District uh, in a management catchment called Devon East. The operational catchment is the Sid and Otter. And then the water body we're looking at here is the river Sid itself. So you can see the kind of the catchment, the extent of the catchment of the river Sid. This is, we're looking at the water framework directive classification. Um, so this was the European Union directive that we um, obviously were signed up to until very recently. I, we have said we'll continue working to it, but there are already signs that the Environment Agency are preparing to um, backtrack from that, I think. Um, and this, this kind of uh, forced us to do uh, quite comprehensive monitoring on all, all different aspects of the river. So you can investigate all the river, all the water bodies in the West Country using this and indeed the country. And you can see that uh, for 2019, when the last classification was done, uh, the overall classification was moderate, which means failing because all river bodies, all water bodies were supposed to achieve good status. So that's the aim. Um, so if it's not, it's failing. Um, and you can see just some some sort of statistics about the about the catchment there area and that sort of thing. Then this would be on the same website normally. I'd, you'd have to scroll down. You can see how that classification is made up. So you've got the overall water body status, which has gone from good in 2013 through poor back to moderate um, in 2019. Um, and you can see that's broken down as ecological status and chemical status. And then as you kind of move in each of these each of these levels, you start to see different elements that got, go to make up that overall classification. What's interesting about the SID is there is no mention at all of fish. Um, I can only assume that that's because the Environment Agency have essentially written it off fish. I'm not entirely sure. They, they, you find this from time to time. Normally a classification will involve fish, um, but sometimes they just say, well, there's no hope, so we won't even look for fish. I don't know. Um, but essentially, the problems then, what's dragging the, what's, what's failing the SID is this moderate um, classification for macrophytes and phytobenthos. Um, so plants essentially that live in or on the, on the riverbed. And um, new for 2019 is this chemical fail. Now that's not a surprise. Every single water body in the UK or in England anyway, fails the chemical status tests. That's because they introduce new, new chemical tests, which look at accumulations of um, mercury in particular, and I think it's polybrominated diphyl ethers, so essentially a, a toxic bioaccumulative chemical that's in flame retardants and lots of other industrial processes. So across the whole country, these chemicals have reached um, high enough levels essentially in our, in our aquatic biota that they're in fish essentially, that they're failing these new tests. Um, the other the other bit of information the Environment Agency provides us with is these reasons for not achieving good status. It used to be known as reasons for failure, but you can't say failure anymore, so it's reasons for not achieving good. Um, and just at a high level, it kind of breaks it into um, nutrient management by agriculture and rural land management. And you can see the impact is all on, on the microphytes and phytobenthos. Um, septic tanks from domestic general public, poor soil management. So, of course, that has an impact on um, nutrification, the soil comes along with a lot of um, 
nutrients, chemical problems, and also it kind of clogs uh, spawning gravels and can lead to quite um, harsh conditions, if you like, in the riverbed <clears throat> and poor livestock management. So that's kind of um, cows and sheep and whatnot getting in, in the river or pooing all over the place. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I know about the River Sid from the Environment Agency's data. And we'll come on to that a bit more about that later. Um, so just to sort of pull in the biodiversity thing then, I don't suppose any of this really will be a surprise to anybody, but just to underline how, how absolutely crucial um, rivers are in, in biodiversity, they punch well above their weight, you know. Um, and so I was looking at the Global Biodiversity Outlook number five a couple of days ago, and there's some stats in there that despite covering only 1% or so of the Earth's surface, they are home to approximately a third of vertebrate species and 10% of all species. And in the UK and in our landscape, we, we know that rivers and their corridors are absolutely key for connecting different habitats and, and wildlife corridors. Um, the other interesting thing is that whilst we might set out sometimes to reduce flooding or reduce uh, vulnerability to drought, you find time and time again that the things we need to do to achieve that um, end up introducing habitat diversity. Uh, so, you know, um, artificial uniformity is a big enemy of, of river health and, of course, of biodiversity itself. So um, things like introducing large woody debris into rivers, into holding more water in the landscape, um, all has massive improvements for river health and comes along with it is, you know, diverse habitats, which helps with biodiversity. But, you know, not just in, in not just globally, but certainly in the UK and England, um, diversity itself and, and the, you know, the richness of species we have is, is dropping, uh, is in free fall essentially, and there's, there's a lot going on. I also had cause the other day to look up this. I don't know if any of you have read it. I've only opted for the headline messages, which is only 10 pages. The, the summary report is 100 and odd pages, and the, the proper report is several hundred. But it was a report commissioned by the government to, to look at really the, the link between biodiversity and the economy. And, and again, there's some fairly unsurprising um, statements in there about how fundamental biodiversity is to the resilience of nature and how fundamental in turn, in turn nature is to our well-being, but also to our productivity, essentially. At the root of everything we do is, is some kind of natural um, resource, and we're really not looking after them as we should. But I also saw a couple of interesting quotes in there about, which really sort of piqued my interest around the, the opportunities for, for stuff, for action at community level, which really ties in well with the, the whole CSI scheme. So this one here about the information required for managing ecosystems. And I think, you know, perhaps the data I've shown from the Environment Agency and the data I will show, shows a bit how you know, no national or even regional body has the reach these days to look and to understand your local environment as much as you do. Um, but, and so local communities have a big role to play alongside, of course, governments, regional, national and international organisations. The other thing they say in the report is how we're becoming so disconnected from nature that actually um, so many people don't even know what's being lost now. They talk about the shifting baseline between, you know, if, if the biodiversity loss in my lifetime is 10%, well, that actually represents maybe a 200% 200 represent, 200, um, drop in what it was in my parents' lifetime because that baseline is shifting. I only know what wasn't there, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So again, in terms of CSI, it really provides a means by which people connect with their environment. We know people who adopt a, a couple of river monitoring sites, and of course they go there every month and they look at it in the same through the same lens, if you like. You really can see the good things, the bad things, the changes, the improvements. It's a, it's really key for that. Um, I'm gonna, I've talked a little bit about it, but I'll, I'll delve a bit more into what's the problem, um, because it's not you know no longer are we faced with kind of factories spewing toxic green waste if we ever were in, in the West Country. There were some issues like that, still are a couple, but um, by and large, the, that kind of point source pollution has been um, mopped up, if you like, and pretty much stopped. Um, but there's a lot of kind of, um, on the face of it, quite benign things that all together cumulatively really add up to, to put our rivers under threat. So diffuse pollution from sediment, these are mostly articles I've picked out of the paper, um, just because I thought it was, you know, it's such a benign thing. People just assume that when it rains, the rivers will be brown, and, and sure they do. But there's there's a cost to that, and that's, yeah, it can be measured in 
that very sort of bottom of the food chain, if you like. So um, mayfly or, or caddisfly eggs not, not hatching, essentially, um, because of phosphate and sediment in the gravels. So, you know, it's not that there's piles and piles of dead creatures around, they just never make it into existence in the first place. Um, and again, this is again a selection of um, newspaper articles around antibiotics, plastics, microplastics, um, insecticides um, from various sources. Um, there's the mayfly again, um, drugs, pharmaceuticals, um, drugs again. And then this one in Argentina, where all of a sudden, because people have been messing around with the landscape and its ability to hold water, all of a sudden the river said one day, I'm off in a different direction. It, it just literally appeared overnight. But what this tells us is actually, it's very difficult to pin it down to one thing. And the problem is essentially that rivers reflect the lives we lead around them and in them. You know, those, those, we don't think of rivers as a linear feature. They're basically an area, you know, that catchment area. Every toilet that's flushed in that area, every car that's washed, every piece of litter that's dropped it, within that area will eventually make its way to the river. And that includes, you know, if, if people are taking more uh, anxiety drugs and, and putting them down the toilet or even just excreting them, that all ends up in the rivers if, the, if our waste treatment systems aren't up to scratch, and they're not really, um, or our connectivity around rivers, you know, the, the way we ferry water into the rivers very quickly um, is, is kind of artificially adding to that um, problem. Um, so again, just some sort of, you know, just some pictures to show you what's going on. Uh, fine sediment we've talked about, soil compaction. So bigger machinery on the land at different times of the year leads to the soil being compacted so that in many ways it acts like a car park essentially. So when the water rain, when, uh, when it rains, the water hits it and runs off very quickly. So what I've got there is, uh, is a hydrograph. This is taken from the Environment Agency website, so it's real data of what happens when it rains in a certain river somewhere, I don't know, in the West Country somewhere. And you can see how immediately it goes straight up in the air, you know, so the, the water level rises really quickly. And you can imagine the kind of stuff it will take into the river from the landscape. If you think back to the slide with all the rivers and the, the surface water dominated, but probably within, what's that, each one of those is a day. So within four or five hours, it's pretty much back down to where it started. So apart from that massive influx of dirty water, quick and dirty water, two days later, the river's no better off. So then when you have another six weeks of, of dry weather after that, the rivers really struggle. Whereas what we'd like to see, and I'll show you an example in a minute, is a much more um, gentle hydrograph, if you like. That's a little noisy video I recorded here in view, just of, um, again, rainfall, heavy rainfall event, hitting um, steep paved areas and just charging off down the river, uh, to the river, taking all sorts of rubbish with it. Um, we also see, you know, misconnections, sewer discharges. So that's a, a sewage a discharge. Actually, it's like an overflow discharge. So it should really be surface water. But what you're seeing here, this grey water, is to do someone's plumbed their washing machine into there. So that's not going to help with a lot of phosphate in the river. Again, agricultural issues around slurry spreading and pesticides and herbicides going on the land. That stuff gets washed in the rivers if it's not done at the right time. Um, barriers to fish migration, I know you've got some, some examples of that where weirs put into the rivers for various reasons, you know, some of may have had a lot of merit 100 years ago and not so much now, but they've become part of the landscape and can be pretty hard to shift, I know you know a lot about that. And there's, there's that guilty looking um, lady in the river there, I caught her red-handed, so, so stock access to rivers, you know, they, they plod around in there doing their business and um, just not, not helping. This slide here then shows a bit more detail about what I was talking about, that storm hydrograph, because it's absolutely crucial, like I say, in a, in a surface water dominated area as we live in here. So what will happen is rivers bimbling along quite happily at average sort of flow, we get some rain, then that rain makes its way to the river through a number of different pathways, the water level goes up or the flow in this case goes up um, and then drops back down again. But as we start to interfere with that landscape, as we've been doing for decades, you get this kind of much more flashy, we call it, response where it rises very quickly and you're more likely to have flooding then because your water level, your water flow is much higher at peak flow. But um, again, you know, in a short time, a few hours later, it's as if nothing ever happened apart from the river's now full of sediment in all sorts of horrible places. What we're really trying to do is look at ways how we can slow down the waters, the rainfall, if you like, its passage into the river in the first place. 
and with a catchment, which is like a, a fractal, essentially a very complicated system, you're very unlikely to find one solution that does that. It's little things all over the place that needs to do that, just to hold up water wherever you can in a sensible, controlled way. So it's water butts, it's you know rain gardens, it's um, disturbing drainage ditches, although don't do that without the relevant permissions, but it's kind of looking for all those opportunities to hold water in the landscape. We refer to this as kind of that, that brown line there is the kind of the quick and dirty water. The, the blue line is the slower clean water because that as that water makes its way to the river slowly, it will be filtered by either moving through the ground or you know being stopped up behind a, a vegetation dam or going into a swale or into you know holding into someone's water pipe. All those kind of things have the effect of cleaning the water. And the other really important thing is, of course, the water is still reaching the river several days later. So you're much less likely to be so vulnerable to dry periods and droughts. So that's really fundamental. It's worth that's worth having in your mind at all times, essentially. Um, one great example of of ways to do that is what they're now referring to natural flood management, although that didn't last long in our quote. Nature-based solutions or working with natural processes, but essentially beavers are are really great for biodiversity. You know, when beavers go, in, I mean, the the picture on the top left there. I hope again you might be mirrored, but anyway, the the, the picture on the top is of a an artificial dam put in by um, people we were working with, so an artificial woolly debris dam. And then of course below that is a beaver dam. Now we do try and mimic beavers by putting woolly debris in rivers and, and trying to slow the flow. It doesn't really work very well in my experience. Rivers are, are too demanding. Um, a big heavy flow event and if you're not there to patch it up the next day like a beaver would be, you'll find a hole has appeared in your dam and then that gets bigger and bigger next time. So to my mind for this kind of thing there's no matter Matching, matching the beavers themselves. And of course, those beaver ponds, um, the complexes they make behind them are fan absolutely fantastic for, for biodiversity, those wetland areas. So i am talk a bit now about the West Country CSI scheme. Um, it's been running in various forms for five or six years, I guess. We started it on the River Tamar, so you can see a cluster of survey points there uh, as Tamar CSI, but it very soon sort of grew beyond that. And we have now um, a couple of hundred people doing it across the West Country, and that's growing uh, every day. Um, and we've logged something, we must be approaching 5,000 surveys in the, in the five years. We, we broke over 1,000 surveys last year in a year, and we've already gone over 1,000 surveys in 2021. And so it, this is really exploding. That kind of interest people have in their local environments is really, we're really seeing it through the interest in our CSI scheme, and that's not only by by individual people, it's by groups such as yourself, and it's by um, other organizations, so like the Wildlife Trust, the National Trust, the Woodland Trust, um, and various catchment partnerships are coming to us and saying, we're really interested in this scheme, you know, how do we get it going in our area? So that's fantastic. It does mean that I'm very busy, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, the scheme is basically a, a survey form. It's two sides of A4. Um, it skirts through everything pretty much, in at a, but at quite a um, high level of, uh, or quite a low level of detail, if you like. It was always meant to be an introduction to you know, how your river works and, and, and a way of gathering the information we need to know if it's in good health or not. But also, because we have ambitions to have several, well, probably, we'll probably need four or 5,000 volunteers ultimately across to cover all those 850 water bodies. Um, it needs to be fairly easy to pick up and get on with. Um, and certainly throughout the lockdown of last year, we really tested the, the way of sort of people doing it off their own back. So we provide um, information uh, as to how to do it, videos and things. And very rarely do we now come out and actually train people face to face. We can do online training sessions, but people seem to be able to pick it up pretty quickly. It, it's, it's um, I wouldn't say it's foolproof, but it's, it's pretty robust. Um, so yeah, we asked you about those kind of things. Um, we supply some water testing equipment with it as well. Uh, this is a, it's a compromise between what is fairly easy to do, cheap to do, reliably can be done for those for that kind of money, and it is also um, relevant, obviously. So one one measure we use is total dissolved solids, just a little probe that costs us about um, seven or eight pounds. It measures essentially the conductivity of the water. Um, and translates that into a figure for total dissolved solids. So it's telling us what's dissolved in the water that you might not be able to see. So think of um, think of the, the color in your tea or the sugar in your tea, maybe. You, once it's in there, you can't see it, but you know it's there. In, in the rivers, this can be an indication of um, pollution. 
so sewage or slurry runoff um, often uh, of course there's an element which is down to the background geology so we're looking for changes from normal the other Simon, the other Simon sorry to interrupt just for a second I, I've had um, Carissa saying she would like to ask a question I forgot to mention at the beginning um, could anybody who wants to ask a question please uh, put it in the chat and I'll field those for Simon at the end of the talk although I think there's probably few enough of us that we can actually ask you to ask those questions at the end. But apologies, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So uh, please do that. Okay, thanks. That'd be good. Um, the, on the other side of things is we're looking at what's suspended in the water, so what's kind of visible. So the stability tube is a is a very simple and easy um, way of measuring, if you like, the optical clarity of the water. Um, and then we're able to include these phosphate test strips. Phosphate is a important pollutant, if you like, contributing to eutrophication, so that overabundance of nutrients. It can come from farms, it can come from sewage treatment works, it can come from domestic homes. So we're not picking on anyone in particular by looking at phosphate, and it's quite an easy test to do, and um, it's, it's very useful for us. So, so in summary, that's the sort of, sort of water, water testing side of things. We're also looking at pH strips for certain areas and ammonia and nitrate strips. Again, it's not, um, it's not ubiquitous because that adds a bit to the, the faff factor of doing the sampling uh, but in certain areas where those things are particularly uh, a problem or possibly a problem we can add those tests in and we have a few groups trialing that now. Um, so that's the water testing. The next slide then talks about so on the survey form there's a, there's a section for wildlife spotted um, and I thought it'd be a good excuse for me to go and find some lovely pictures of, of the wonderful creatures that we, we have. Again, so there are numerous ways you can record wildlife. Uh, what we've included on the CSI form is essentially the, the, the qualif qualifiers had to be a species that's easily recognizable for a start. You know, we, we haven't got the ability to do day-long training sessions for people, so they need to be pretty simple and straightforward to identify. And I think, you know, you can probably all name these, these um, creatures, hopefully, um, just for just in case, you've got a, a dipper, an otter, a grey wagtail, kingfisher, that's a damselfly or a demoiselle, a water vole, brown trout, heron, and a salmon. But on the survey form, we just ask people to record if they see any fish. So you don't need to worry about whether it's a stickleback or a shark, really. Um, it's the same to us. In terms of indicating the health of the environment at a broad, a broad kind of level, um, obviously all of these creatures, they're either bottom of the food chain or they're indicative that some part of the food chain is working, that there's some elements of you know, a healthy ecosystem there. So we ask people to record sightings of those. There's another section on the form for invasive species, or I think we call it problem plants, um, because there's one of them that isn't particularly invasive, but is a problem anyway, maybe. Um, but, and again, so here, you might not be able to quite see these so, so easily. We've got um, Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, skunk cabbage is one that made it onto the list uh, after a couple of years, curly waterweed, um, that one's gone, my mind's gone blank, hang on a minute, it's down here somewhere, that'd be floating pennywort, that one on the middle, and then um, we had mink on the, on the wildlife spotted until a, a last year, but no one ever spotted a mink, so we took it off, um, and signal crayfish have never been on because we don't actually encourage people to get in the river for this one. And so there's not really, we, we have had them recorded because some people have a bit of a poke about when they're doing river fly and stuff like that. But um, uh, again, it's just an indication of, of some of the invasive species that are out there. Like I say, we don't have a survey methodology that recommends people get in the river. Most of it's done remotely. Um, just really some sort of notes on most of those plants. The issues with those are, uh, particularly with things like Himalayan balsam, it completely outcompetes everything else, um, can leave whole river banks and, and miles and miles of them uh, just you know, smothered in, in that and that alone, which is obviously terrible for the diversity part of biodiversity. Um, the other problem with Himalayan balsam is it will, it's very shallow rooted and dies off completely over the winter. So it stops any kind of understory developing, which leaves your river banks bare of any plants in the winter months. So very vulnerable to erosion in particular, um, which as we've already talked about, exacerbates that sort of fine sediment problem. So there's those few elements, the survey form, there's other things, I, I think it was on the other slide about substrate and stuff, but then 
we, again, uh, last year, I suppose, we formalized all this a bit more. We've started to ask people to go to certain locations um, which are strategic in the river network, and they are very often um, abandoned or, or old environment agency monitoring points. They're, doing, they're covering a lot fewer than they used to, so we've, we've tried to pick them up to kind of make sure we still get a data record there from there. Plus, they are, generally speaking, accessible and safe places to access the river. And we take all that data, and, and last year was the first time that we produced these catchment scorecards. Um, I think we did, we had enough data last year to do about 25 different water bodies. The nearest one to you is the lower, lower calm. So obviously the SID wasn't being, didn't get started until I think October last year. So hopefully, well, I'm sure we'll have enough data for a scorecard in 2021. Um, and this kind of summarizes that data into, you can just see the sort of the, the wheel there. Um, we give it an overall grade. Uh, we try not, it's not really, um, it's not really competing with that Environment Agency Water Framework Directive classification. It's kind of an, an alternative. It's just a sort of summary of the data, but it does allow us to compare across different river catchments and, and see how, di how a certain river catchment will change over time. Obviously, there's some um, vulnerability, if you like, to varying survey methods and, and different numbers of people joining or, or leaving the scheme. But nonetheless, it's a really useful guide for what the data is telling us. So there's a bit of a breakdown in terms of the I don't think you can really see that. You probably can. Um, the dissolved solids, the suspended solids, uh, the pollution scores, so part of the survey form asked about pollution sources, the phosphate levels, and that one on the bottom is the ecology made up from the wildlife scores and the invasive species scores. On the back of the form, on the back of the two sides, is a, uh, it shows you the data that went into that and a bit of a um, commentary, really, on, on what was good and bad and what was found in the river that year. So like I say, we're looking forward to doing a lot more of these um, next year, 2021 with the 2020, with the 2021 data. Um, having a little look at the results that um, Jan and her colleagues have collected. So they've managed 56 surveys at the time of um, uh, yesterday when I pulled the data off at, at basically 16 locations. Um, we've had a couple of otter sightings and, and dippers, uh, 11 gray wagtails and one fish. I was, I was surprised not to see any kingfishers, but then again, you know, we don't really um, have a, a stipulated wildlife observation sort of routine, if you like. So a lot of, I mean, I know when I do these surveys myself, sometimes you're turning up in the middle of the day when, you know, wildlife won't be around. And so it's just, it is interesting that, you know, I think when people start to see that the wildlife they know is there maybe isn't reflected in the surveys, they might start thinking, well, perhaps I'll have to go and do my surveys at seven o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock at night and vary that and just, you know, approach the survey site with, um, with caution, I always do, just in case there's something fascinating lurking there. The other, the sort of the word cloud, which I've, I've produced there, well, it wasn't me, it was a web app, is made from the other wildlife. So we have those indicator species, which we are very keen to capture um, because they tell us about the health of the ecosystem. But we also know that there's a lot of people, you know, it, well, it's really useful to record what other wildlife we see there. So it looks a bit chaotic there. On each of the forms, those wildlife sightings of, you know, the molehills and the blackbirds and the pheasants are all logged with a time and a date and a location um, for us to refer back to later. Um, some more good stuff. Um, I've alluded a few times to environment agency data. Um, so I had a look at their their online data, which is fantastic. You can see, I think you see sample results on the um, Environment Agency website a couple of days after they exit the lab, essentially. So it's really good. But And, and there were there are a couple of points of interest in the SID catchment. What is less um, good, I guess, is that two of those have not been sampled since 2015. Um, and the other one there at Pitbrook Farm only started in 2021. So essentially at the moment, the only sampling going on in the river, uh, Sid, is that site at Brook Farm. I don't know why it's there. Um, you might know why it's there. There might have been a local incident there. It's probably, I mean, we'd have to ask the Environment Agency, but it's probably due to some kind of local investigation. By and large, the Environment Agency have um, reduced their monitoring so much to, to a point where it's not really useful for people like me who are trying to determine the state of our rivers across the region. The, the sort of uniform, if you like, sampling program that we are trying to emulate now with the CSI scheme, you know, trying to cover all rivers everywhere once a month at least, 
um, the Environment Agency have, have kind of abandoned that approach through lack of funding and lack of resources. So they're really prioritizing um, their monitoring now. So what they'll have, I guess they'll have said with the CID is, it's fairly healthy, we've got other issues elsewhere, um, we'll have to prioritize our, our sort of, um, our resources there. So, you know, I think, you know, for communities to step forward and, and take a look at their own rivers, hopefully using our CSI scheme has never been more important. And you can see there, so whilst, you know, the data gathered at these places by the environment agency is a, is a formal sample, bottle goes off to a laboratory and is analyzed for wide range of parameters to a very high level of accuracy. We can't do that, but we can cover much more area and much more often. So, you know, we're looking at 56 tests um, in 2000 and, uh, well, since October 2020 uh, versus five done by the Environment Agency in that time. Um, just notice this one has probably got out of order. It's, uh, I was talking about the, so it really refers back to the results from the SID and what we did have, one of the other sightings of a, a problem plant was this um, three-cornered garlic in the, in the um, little tributary down there. Another part of the survey form is the ability to submit photos. So I've just got a sort of selection here of, of photos that have been captured across the SID showing different you know, issues. That one there is a fish jumping up or trying to jump up the school weir. Um, various other highlights and lowlights. You know, we've got, some, we've got some litter in this one, another one of the school weir. Um, that was a, a culvert. This is a collapsing river bank here. And this is a massive bank of um, Japanese knotweed. So um, yeah, I think that's fortuitously, that's about the end. I always leave people with this, or I bring this one up to the end because there, there is stuff you can do. Like I say, the, our river systems are arranged in such a way that it's gonna take thousands and thousands of small things being done or not being done to, to help turn them around. There are people, landowners, sewage treatment works, those kind of people who have a lot of influence on our rivers and they need to do their bit, but there's, there's something that all of us can do. And that chap there, Ted, is my Mitchell Schnauzer. I like to include him because he has been very good, but he goes berserk if anyone comes near the door. So had there been uh, a very high-pitched barking interruption, it would have been Ted. But just to run through those, so, you know, um, thinking back to the that, that Rivers Everywhere map, um, you know, it's not just that big blue thing over there with a big, with a name. You can have an influence on that by looking close to home and seeing where your water goes. Where does the rain that falls on your roof go and what does it take with it? Um, number two there, uh, help to hold it in the landscape where you can, reduce that runoff, do your bit to bring that hydrograph back to the, the slow and clean sort of side of things. And, um, and then number three, yeah, any water you're using has come from a river or a reservoir or an aquifer. And so if you can use less, less from your tap, more of it remains in the natural environment where it's, it's so badly needed. Um, we've seen, you know, the kind of idea around urban, urban rivers and, and the problems with those. So think about those chemicals, think about the life cycle of those chemicals, whether it's, you know, not so much drugs you're taking, but if it's cleaning products you're using, or if, it, if you're out and about in the garden using uh, slug pellets and things like that, um, it's going to end up somewhere and it's in, it's in, in the ecosystem. Let's, let's avoid that if we possibly can. And then finally, um, yeah, sign up to West Country CSI, have a chat with, with me. You can email me or we can um, chat with Jan and, and find out what's involved. We can always accommodate more volunteers. We've got 854 water bodies. Um, we tend to say that we'll have samples done once a month, but to be honest, if we had so many people that we had them done every day, I would have to Get some help on board, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be too much data. Essentially, there's there's always something going on. Okay, so that's okay. pretty much on time. I'll just leave you with that one because I made it go round like that, and I think it's quite. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Simon. That was a really good talk. Lovely to uh, hear the messages. It's great. Um, there were a few things that, that I picked up on and we've got a few few questions coming in, but if anybody else wants to ask other questions, then then please do so. I mean, I think the the idea of the, the, the scorecard and getting that published so that we can make that available you know, more locally and see, you know, 
whether we can make an impact or have an impact on that over time, which sort of harks back to the, the baseline thing that, that you talked about and, and is so important because if we don't know what we've got, you don't know whether it's coming or going, do you? So you've, you've got to get some measurements in there. Um, yeah, I'd also encourage people if, if you haven't heard of the Dasgupta report uh, to have a look at that. I mean, and again, I can't claim to have read the whole report or even the uh, the middle middle range one, but uh, yeah, it's fascinating nonetheless. Right, I'm just going to go into the chat and um, we had something from uh, Tim Newton, which was actually a question that, that I had scribbled down as well. Um, he was talking about the Tain and I was thinking about the Otter, okay, outside our area, but um, the, the Otter is going to be changed um, and the sea is going to be allowed to come back in. And um, Tim's question, which was, as I say, similar, how do you differentiate between the pollution from the different sources, i.e. with the sea and uh, the river side of it? So you, you know, you've got both of those things affecting the base of the estuary. Um, yeah. Not so much on the SID because we don't have that big an area, but, but for those other two rivers, and I'm sure many more, uh, that must have an impact. Yes, I would say, you know, I mean, the, the CSI scheme and, and the vast majority of our monitoring is focused on fresh water. So um, we know that there are a large number of issues in, in fresh water. In my experience, the sea is, is nowhere near as polluted generally, you know, in terms of um, chemical contaminants for sure. So it's much less likely to cause you the kind of issues that we're up against with, um, with our river pollution and where we have you know, bathing water issues in the, on the coast, they're, I say, 99 times out of 100 caused by rivers um, and, you know, the things that rivers bring with them, so both agricultural and um, sewage generated, shall we say, human sources of bacteria, essentially, in terms of uh, bathing waters, and, of course, nutrients, you know, um, nitrate and phosphate running off with soil. So um, there, I've never come across a, 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 an instance, if you like, where a pollution problem was the result of salt water um, polluting a, an area, although it does, you know, does it is a source of plastics. But I think we we recognise as well that you know actually most of those plastics originate in rivers, and our rivers are no different. You know, the connection between our road system and our rivers is so um, efficient, you know, to keep the roads free of water that it takes an awful lot of plastics, both macro and micro, um, with them into the sea. So yeah, I haven't, I've never yet really come across an issue where um salt water is causing pollution issues in an estuary okay thank you um this question from from maya uh is the well, there, there are three questions are all linked is the csi survey devon wide which areas need more which you've touched on and are you linking into the new wildlife warden schemes scheme so yes, so the West Country CSI scheme is is West Country wide. So the graph, the map I showed of, of essentially the West Country um, Rivers Trust area of influence. Um, so that's Cornwall, all of Cornwall, all of Devon, and parts of Somerset and parts of Dorset. So there's a the line is the line between our neighbours, if you like, which is Bristol Avon Rivers Trust in the north and Wessex Rivers Trust. They just have changed their name. They were Wessex Chalk Streams Trust. So Wessex Rivers Trust, I think they are now on the on our eastern boundary, if you like, are as you'd expect, drawn along catchment watersheds. But we are we're talking to both of those about you know whether they want to take up the scheme um, or whether they whether they do something slightly different. At least within the West Country, we're trying to kind of bring as many people as we can on board. And I know that we're speaking with West uh, with Devon Wildlife Trust and various other trusts, the National Trust, the Woodland Trust, um, various district councils and, and county councils about using the scheme and inputting on what, you know, how they can adjust the scheme if we need to, rather than having lots of different schemes, because these are quite, um, you know, when you've, when you've got something that works like this, it's nice to, if, if as many people will jump on board as possible. So yes, it's across that area, but we're also talking to the, the Rivers Trust about maybe piloting it in other areas as well. So we, I think we're working with the ambition of having a national volunteer monitoring scheme. Um, that's something that the Environment Agency support as well at a top level. So 
in one way, shape or form, I'm sure that will happen um, before very much longer. Um, areas where it's needed, well, yes. So we have some hotspots, you know, where it's, um, where we've got a lot of coverage. So rivers like the Dart, the Otter's quite well covered or has been. Um, we're really improving the scheme all the time in terms of the support we give to people to retain those volunteers. Um, it's not difficult, it's not easy rather to, to keep on top of all that with just a couple of us running the scheme, but we, we do our best to kind of keep people up and running. And, and so that's a, a key issue for us is ideally if you can stick with it for a year or so, um, taking samples once a month, and that gives us the kind of longevity of data, we can start to build momentum. But community groups um, like yourself are, are so important in, in providing that local cohesion and that kind of, you know, adopting the plan and really and really taking it to heart. And what was the last question? Uh, is it does it link into the new wildlife warden scheme? So yeah, well, um, the the team wildlife wardens are certainly signed up. So, but I didn't know about that until they got in touch. So yes, it's, it's well set up for anybody to kind of who's interested in, in rivers or wildlife to kind of get on board. Like I say, we've designed it so it's fairly straightforward. It was always designed to be entry level. So some of you may have heard of the river fly monitoring scheme. Um, we were always aware of that and made sure that we didn't kind of step on their toes, but we nudged up nicely against it. So a lot of people do CSI and then graduate to river fly. Uh, if you don't know, river fly is a bit more involved um, looking at the invertebrates in the, in the substrate of a river, looking for particularly the abundance of eight different types of, of um, river insect invertebrates essentially that can give an indication of the health of an ecosystem, but also whether it's changed. So particularly if those levels drop, all of a sudden that's an indication of pollution events happen. So we work with those, those people. I've done the river fly training myself just recently. Um, and, and really, if you're more, if you find an interest through doing CSI in identifying different species of dragonfly or um, invasive plants, then there's probably somewhere for you to go and we can match you up with someone to do that. But CSI is a great entry point to give us a bit of a, a look at everything that we need to see. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm from um, Carissa Brown saying fantastic talk. And could this is I, I knew there'd be a nasty question. Could you paint your picture of a, a healthy river form and does it match the environment agency's picture? Yeah, I don't think we disagree on on you know what a healthy river is. My um, my my big problem is we, we have so little reliable data now that we just don't know. And and with the environment agency seem very reluctant to say that that we don't know. So in the case of the SID there, you know, that you can see they've rated it moderate in 2019. They haven't taken a sample between 2015 and 2019. So how can they possibly know? They there is an assumption that if they don't check, it won't change. And I just uh, unfortunately that's not the case. Um, we do, you know, we do have some healthy rivers or parts of in the West Country, and it's a real joy when you when you come across one. Um, they tend to be in headwaters, you know, where where their the landscape is is more natural, I suppose, you know, and water is allowed to filter into the into the streams in a more um, more natural way. It's it's all about that hydrograph really and the land use that generates it. So, yeah, it's it's lovely to see when you come across a river with you know clear water and um, three, you know, water flowing free through a substrate. You know, there's a good section of connected habitat. You know, you've got nice um, uh, connection with the flood plain. That's another thing we don't see very often is a lot of our rivers, particularly by the time they reach our kind of lowland sections, they've been cut off. They're no longer allowed to spill, of course, because we live right up against the edge. So we can't possibly have them in our homes. And I understand why people feel that way. But that kind of ability for a river to move in and out of its flood plain is really crucial to to maintaining those kind of um, natural uh, forms of geom you know, that natural fluvial morphology, which leads naturally to that diversity of habitat that's so important. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one from Mick. Uh, I believe there are guidelines for farmers on preventing soil damage. Are there any guidelines for ramblers or walkers to limit damage by walking on paths and reducing <laughs> runoff uh, in rivers? Not that I'm aware again, but it's but it's it comes down to the opportunity people have to do harm, I suppose. And you know, we see 
not every day, but in many, many cases. And a lot of reports come through from the CSI scheme because we are looking out for things like, um, you know, cattle poaching and, and collapsed riverbanks. But there are rules around, you know, how much, um, how much access, if you like, stock are allowed to rivers. Again, in my experience, they're very rarely enforced. Um, and so at the moment, and I've talked about the environment it's in their prioritization, you know, the, the things that are, are doing damage to our rivers are by and large but by those people who have the opportunity to do that. And it's not really, you know, it's not so much ramblers um, in terms of things like sediment runoff. Um, although there's, a, there's, a, there's obviously a role for reducing the connectivity that can be provided by footpaths sometimes. But like I say, in, it's not, it really pales into insignificance, I think, in, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, a couple, I think, of comments rather than questions. One, one saying uh, from Maya that she attended Rivers Trust talk to farmers on water pollution and uh, that that message is being taken back from, at least by her, to other farmers in the community. And of course, that's, that's an issue that we all need to do or try and encourage, isn't it, I think? And from Absolutely. And actually, that, that, that sort of prompts me to say that we're really keen, if, if you know of any farmers, that they, they're absolutely welcome to take part in the CSI scheme as well. You know, the CSI scheme is about bringing up everyone's level of knowledge about what's good and bad, because so many people have said to me, you know, when they see cows in the river, they say, well, that's fine, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just completely unnatural. Well, not really, you know, not, not, in, um, not in extremists anyway. The odd one or two here and there won't matter, but there are issues where that's a, that can be a real problem and of course it's again it's that cumulative effect so yeah we're really keen to have farmers involved and we do we get a lot of farmers sign up and and do the monitoring um it's not about vilifying or pointing fingers it's just about taking ownership as a community of of that kind of level of knowledge about what's going on in your local environment and bringing up everyone's level of appreciation about what they can do yeah that goes back to that baseline again isn't it the the, the wider it can be uh, found out the uh, the more knowledge we get and then uh, final comment, I think, from uh, Marion Rickson is, is harking back to your comment from two questions ago, is you know, we're still allow, allowing building within floodplains, which of course is not helping in terms of uh, uh, you know, keeping the rivers clean and all of the other problems that are associated with those buildings in, in risky areas, I think. Yeah. yeah. And that's another really interesting point in the Dasgupta review, actually, about the, the imbalance between the amount of money that's spent and, and the way people are encouraged to um, promote and increase certain activities that kind of have a direct impact on economic growth, if you like. Whereas, you know, the kind of the benefits we get from our natural environment are a little bit harder to see straight away in the short term, or are certainly the damage sometimes, but no less um, important in terms of the ultimate impact on our economic growth. So there's a, a real imbalance between, you know, if you want to build a supermarket, um, everything's in your favour, but if you want to, you know, you know, return an area of agricultural land or a, a, a bit of a car park to, to woodland, you'll really struggle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, Jan, you've got a question. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Simon. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I wanted to ask about the chemical failure. Um, you, you, you were sort of reassuring in the sense that you said most rivers do fail the chemical test. Um, I was wondering where, what the source of the mercury in its compounds uh, or the polybrominated diphenyl esters might be in, in the river Sid. Would they come from the, uh, the, the waste um, site, the landfill site on the Roncum or? In the fact that it's everywhere, that makes me think that it's probably to do with roads for a start. You know, there'll be an element of, of the kind of the, we know there are heavy metals in, in tire particles and in fuel deposits and all those kind of things. Um, and then the, um, the polybrominated diphyl ethers, I can only think that that's coming out of um, essentially, it'll either be sort of domestic or industrial discharges, you know, maybe through the sewage systems, but remember, our sewage is only treated some of the time. With the storm overflows, we do get sewage overflows where it's not um, treated, it goes direct into the environment. And the issue with these chemicals is 
they are bioaccumulative. So once they're in the environment, it, they get taken up by organisms and they kind of persist in them. So I know I've spoken, because to be honest, it came as a bit of a surprise to me. The environment agency don't tell me, don't tell me what they're up to. And they didn't tell me that they'd been around sampling fish tissues for the last couple of years in order to, you know, uh, to, to, to kind of adhere to this test. Um, maybe they knew that it was going to fail across the board. I don't know. But anyway, so it's a bit of a surprise, but I've spoken to them since. And, you know, um, they're essentially saying these chemicals are in our environment. They have been for, in some cases, decades. And there is nothing they can do or we can do, really. Many of them, have, you know, many of those sources have been cut off now. But because they're so persistent, they don't expect levels to drop to, they don't expect those rivers to pass again if the, if the tests stay the same for, you know, 10 years or more. So, you know, that is, that's, and again, it comes down to, our rivers reflect the lives we lead around them. You know, we are, we are we have lots of chemicals sloshing around in all sorts of places, and and they will end up in the environment. Okay. Charles, yeah. Um, I don't know. I wanted to take sort of get a bit more of an overview. <clears throat> um, I know when once I was in London some time back, the rivers, the in, in an exhibition, the River Thames was described as one of the cleanest rivers, urban rivers in the world. Um, the there seems to be a lot of sort of cutback from industrial pollution over the last like 20 years or so. Are we in a position at the moment where we're seeing the overall sort of impact on the rivers sort of improving? Or is it, in your view, do you still think <clears throat> we're on a decline? Can I, sorry, so I'm not, I, Marin's come in, which kind of ties to that very neatly saying the Environment Agency has pledged to make sure that 75% of England's rivers are to be considered good by 27. 2027, sorry, but has admitted we are unlikely to meet the target. So, you know, that's sort of the same thing, isn't it? At an overview level, are we getting it, you know, getting anywhere? I think. I, I hope um, I haven't confused everyone by putting the two together. Fine. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is we don't really know. You know, this is the thing. As I showed with the, the data points from the Environment Agency on the SID, you know, um, they have one monitoring point now halfway up a tributary that they test for once a month. So that's essentially one second a month in that river's life. Um, they haven't done any fish surveys on the SID. I guess, I guess the SID is considered a bit of a write-off of fish, which seems a bit defeatist. But, you know, again, I guess it comes down to resources. And um, last I heard, the invertebrate population was fairly healthy. So those, those biological indicators are actually really useful in terms of, you know, is the river healthy? That said, um, I think the situation is changing, you know, and yes, so so levels of kind of acute pollution should be dropping um, with those persistent chemicals that can take a long, long time. Um, but it's the the cumulative impact of the of the apparently quite benign stuff. So the sediment, the phosphate, the the um, not even the sewage, maybe the, the plastics, you know, the microplastics It's that accumulative impact that seems to be taking our aquatic ecosystems downhill um, but you know we have um, we have policy instruments that can reverse it you know so um, increasing pressure on the water companies to do the right thing um, and we have of course the new environmental land management schemes on the horizon which again um, have the potential to, to change things if if we get that right you know obviously we've We've got to be a bit more smart around how we use our land. And to do that, we need to provide the right incentives or disincentives, you know, for doing the wrong or right thing. Um, at the moment, I don't think the balance is right. Not in, it's not in favour of the rivers, but, um, but you know, we live in hope that, that things will improve. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, a couple of comments, but I, I think you'll probably be aware of the um, the SVA survey that was done in 2013, um, uh, which hopefully if you're not, then we can certainly make available because that helps with the baseline on uh, the fish side of things, for sure. Um, and from, from Maya, um, who do you call if we witness an ecological emergency? 
um, finding a dead otter in an unlikely place, <laughs> still in my freezer awaiting transport, it says. Okay. So the first point of call, and actually we, we do put this on the survey form, is the Environment Agency. So they have a hotline number, which is 0800 80, 70, 60, I think. Um, you can look that up on the internet. Um, and because what we don't want is the CSI scheme to kind of come between, you know, if you phone me up with a pollution problem, you might get an answer, but I'll only have to call the Environment Agency anyway. Now, there are a list of, they'll ask you a load of questions, um, like where it is, what you've seen, all that kind of thing. You'll get, you'll be put through to a call centre in Leeds, and then hopefully they'll put, they'll, well, they will pass that message on to somebody locally who will then, hopefully, they're not always, but hopefully get in touch with some kind of next steps. Um, there might be something special for dead otters. I know there was a dead otter project where they were collecting them up and doing autopsies, but I don't know who the contact is for that. I can see if that's still running and, and let you know. Um, but yeah, the environment... Oh, Cardiff University, um, I have already made contact now. Oh, brilliant. And are they still doing that? They're still collecting yeah. up? The they just run out, run out of space at the moment. <laughs> Yes. Uh, maybe not good, actually. Yeah. Well, it's funny, isn't it? Sometimes the, we only know there's wildlife out there because we find it dead on our roads. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's the, the last of the questions and the comments, which uh, was great, very interesting. And once again, Simon, thank you very much for the presentation and all of the, the questions and answers. It's extremely interesting. Uh, I hope and um, I'm sure that we will continue to to support the initiative and if we can do more and you know get more involved then uh, you know, please through Jan and the other volunteers who are involved get back to us and uh, we will uh, spread the word and try and get you some more data. And no, you're doing very well so far you know, you've made a brilliant sort of start and um, we've got a good group there so let's keep, keep it up. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening and all your interesting questions. Good, Jan, that was great. Yes, I, I would have liked to ask a few more questions. <laughs> Take my ears out, I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, I, I would have liked to have asked a few more questions, but um, uh, yeah. Well, okay. there you go. But, you, but you're, you, I mean, the good thing is you're in direct contact with him anyway. And uh, yeah, he's, he's yeah. such a nice man, isn't he? He's, he's, he's just great. He's so yeah. easy to talk to and to listen to, which is, yeah. yeah. yeah suddenly found you know the time had gone almost it was like uh, yeah it was yeah it was very i mean good. i thought the five ways to help your river were quite useful i took a, a screenshot of that but unfortunately there's his picture in the corner but um he's that's